Did you know that almost every Apple promotional image displays the time as 9.41 a.m., the time Steve Jobs unveiled the original iPhone? Apple is just a really unusual company, so welcome to my top 60 things to know about them. Let's start with wacky. There is actually a clause in Apple's current terms and conditions that specifies you're not allowed to use their products to build nuclear missiles or biological weapons. It's good to know. And on the subject of weapons, multiple tests and videos have shown that the way the MacBook is constructed, it can stop bullets in its tracks. I wouldn't recommend you test that theory, but something that a lot of people have unfortunately tested is that smoking around Apple equipment can technically void your warranty. Cigarettes contain nicotine, and because nicotine is technically classed as hazardous, Apple won't force its employees to expose themselves to it. So even if something breaks, they've been known to refuse repairs. Oh yeah, and a massive thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Okay, we all know Apple is wealthy, but it's tough to conceptualize just how wealthy. So to give you an idea, the company makes over $300,000 of revenue per minute. In fact, in 2011, Apple overtook the US government in terms of cash in hand. And what I think is even more impressive is that if you took Apple's current net worth and you donated it, you could give every single human being on the planet over $100. Here's a more real world example of the sheer value. Apple originally had three co-founders, and it's a bit of a tragic story, because whilst you've probably heard of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who stuck with the company, there was a third guy, Ronald Wayne. The reason he's a little less known is that he left the company after just 12 days, selling his entire share in Apple for $800, which, you know, sounds all right, but had he held onto that, it would be worth well over 30 billion now. It wasn't always like this. Apple had a pretty difficult start. Money was short, so much so that Jobs sold his car, and Wozniak had to sell his scientific calculator just for funds. There have been a lot of theories as to where the brand name came from. I've heard everything from scientific to biblical, but it turns out Steve Jobs just happened to be on a fruit-only diet at the time, and he just liked apples. Their logo, equally as unexpected, started off as a picture of Isaac Newton sitting under a tree. This brand, now known for its contemporary and minimalist presentation, used to be represented by this. It symbolizes the story of Newton discovering gravity by observing how an apple fell from a tree. It's only a year later that it changed to something much more familiar. And to start with, it had this kind of rainbow to reflect that their computer was the first to have a color screen. And there was a bite taken out of the apple, for no other reason than just to make it clear that it was indeed an apple, and not a tomato or some kind of other rounded fruit. But the company weren't done yet. This logo went through several iterations before we landed at what we have now, essentially just getting simpler over time. You might have already had a glimpse of this, but in a way, Apple is crazy when it comes to attention to detail. They have really particular ways of doing things, even if they are far from the easiest ways. For example, the animated flower wallpapers you see on the Apple Watch, they're not computer generated. Apple spent hundreds of hours filming real flowers blooming over time. Another instance would be in iOS 6. Apple introduced metallic buttons that would reflect light differently depending on the angle your phone was facing. Both Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, before they were at Apple, they actually worked together at a game development company called Atari, and you actually see remnants of this in Apple products. With the first iPod, there was a hidden Easter egg where you could actually play the game Breakout, developed by these two guys in their last job. And speaking of the iPod, this was a product that went through many stages in development, lots of different shapes and sizes, and when the first iPod prototype was actually given to Steve Jobs, he famously dropped it in an aquarium. He used the resultant air bubbles to prove that there was still space inside the iPod and that it could technically be made smaller. If, by the way, you do enjoy straight to the point tech content like this, a sub would be amazing. We're trying to hit 3 million by the end of the year. You've probably heard of Siri, and you probably also strongly associate Siri with Apple. This was very nearly not the case. Siri actually released as a standalone app on Apple's App Store, and was originally planned to come to both Android and even Blackberry. That is until Apple intercepted this by acquiring Siri and building it exclusively into their own devices. And the voice of Siri ended up being a lady called Susan Bennett, but was very nearly Jeff Goldblum, an actor famous for his roles in a whole number of films, but he's also just kind of a massive meme at this point. Apple have also had a few interesting projects. They were one of the first in the world to make a digital color camera at a time when people were taking photos, and they were used to waiting an entire week before they could actually see them after they were developed, this was kind of huge. They developed a games console called the Pippin. It's kind of amazing that we're talking about a $600 box, which your current smartphone might well be 10,000 times more powerful than. It actually gets more bizarre. Apple launched a clothing line, and if that wasn't strange enough, 
Take one look at how it actually turned out. The Apple Collection, as they called it, was an entire suite of crazy looking clothing launched in 1986. To be fair, it might have been fashionable at the time, maybe. But this is not even the strangest. That award goes to the TAM, or the 20th anniversary Macintosh. In today's terms, this would almost be like the Mac Pro. Pro. It came in at $7,500, which in 1997 was a lot of money. And it was not just like the ultimate machine, but it would be hand delivered by a limousine and set up by a man wearing a tuxedo. If you knew about those and you're a bit of an Apple fan, you might also remember that early Apple laptops, they used to show the logo upside down when you open them. And this, believe it or not, was actually done to avoid confusion. Most people who hadn't used an Apple laptop would try and open them the wrong way around from the base of the Apple. The company eventually gave in and flipped the logo because Let's face it, it looks pretty odd. And speaking of MacBooks, the command key you see on Apple keyboards has a pretty alien looking symbol on it, but it turns out this is actually borrowed from a Swedish road sign, meaning a place of interest. Anyways, 2007, the iPhone is unveiled, but you might not have known that the trademark for iPhone and iOS were actually not owned by Apple, but instead by a networking company called Cisco, and Apple's just been paying them for a license. And on a similar note, for the last 10 years, Apple actually lost the rights to use the iPhone trademark in Brazil. Turns out there was already a company there called Gradient. I could have said that wrong, but they had their own line of iPhones. And so whilst Apple was allowed to sell the iPhone in Brazil, they didn't have exclusive rights to use the name. Even more interesting is that the iPhone that was shown on stage had a plastic display. It's only after the announcement that Steve Jobs, he picked this phone up and he looked at the display and realized it had scratches. He told the team, by the time this phone launches, it has to be glass. And so in a weird kind of way, this was the birth of Gorilla Glass as we know it. The company Corning had actually developed this technology, this durable glass, 40 years ago, but it had just been sitting on a shelf because they had no use for it until the iPhone. Another really interesting thing about this first phone was that it didn't leak. When Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, the world was genuinely taken aback, and the reason for that is just how seriously Apple took the secrecy. Internally, it was given the codename M68, and Apple made sure that the hardware engineers never saw the software, and that the software engineers never saw the hardware. Instead of handing out prototype phones for testing, Apple handed out developer boards that just contained all the iPhone's components. You could connect this board to iTunes and it would be picked up as an iPhone. That's pretty cool. But let's take a step back because Apple's first technically smart phone was actually conceptualized well before 2007. Initial mockups as early as 1983 detailed a landline with smart functionality, kind of like a phone and an iPad joined together. This never ended up seeing the light of day, but just the idea was pretty ahead of its time. Apple's product pricing varies massively depending on the region you live in, partly because of import duties, taxes, and probably partly also because of the company's choice. This meant that whilst the iPhone XS Max last year it was $1,250 in the US for the 256 gig model. It ended up being over 1,700 in India and around 2,000 in Brazil. An iPhone is built using as many as 75 elements, that is two thirds of the entire periodic table or elements known to man. And so it's not entirely surprising that inside an iPhone, you've got small amounts of gold, silver, and platinum. This one's a little morbid, but the way Touch ID works is through capacitive technology by using the fact that our bodies conduct electricity. It means that a dead person's hand or just a 3D mockup wouldn't be able to unlock one of these phones, even if the fingerprint itself was a match. But they would work on the optical scanners we're seeing built into many phone displays now. There is a lot to say about Steve Jobs, in some senses the figurehead of Apple. He was labeled as everything from a visionary and a genius to quite a difficult guy to work with. At one stage, he got cornered into leaving Apple, the very company he'd helped to build. But in this time, after leaving, Steve Jobs did two incredible things. He helped fund a small computer graphics company known as the Graphics Group at the time, but this later became known as Pixar, and in part through his funding, they created Toy Story. The second thing was that Jobs created a completely new computer company called Next. And it was only a matter of time before Apple ended up buying this company, which brought Jobs right back into Apple. Steve was also known for being a little quirky. As is tradition, companies hand out employee numbers to every person who works there. But with Apple, Jobs was supposedly offended that he was given the label of employee number two, whereas Wozniak got number one. And so refusing to play second fiddle, he requested that his number be changed to employee number zero. Jobs also had a real eye for detail. He called the VP of engineering at Google one Sunday morning just to 
tell him that he'd noticed the color of yellow on the second O in Google was slightly off on his iPhone, and for Google to fix it ASAP. For a large part of his time at Apple, Steve Jobs only took a salary of $1 per year. He was so committed to the success of the company that he chose to leave millions inside Apple, as opposed to take it for himself, and instead just banked on earning from the shares he had in the company. You might have also noticed, this guy almost always wore what looks like the exact same turtleneck. He was supposedly inspired by Sony, who had a strict uniform policy, and Jobs wanted to introduce this into Apple. Having been booed off stage for even suggesting the idea, he settled on at least having a consistent image for himself. But Jobs was soon to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and this is an awful thing to have. Tim Cook, the current CEO, at the time, he actually got himself tested. He found out that his blood type matched Steve's and he offered to donate part of his liver, but Steve turned it down. He then passed away in October 2011, the day after the iPhone 4S was announced. Now, that brings us on to Steve Wozniak, who on paper reported only two jobs, so after Steve's passing, Wozniak couldn't actually be fired from the company. But he also had a difficult past. Wozniak was involved in a plane crash while at Apple, and he had some pretty major head injuries, meaning that his short-term memory was almost wiped. He did thankfully eventually recover. Now, Apple's first ever product was not a smartphone, it wasn't an iPod like many people believe, it was a computer called the Apple One, its selling point being the fact that it came pre assembled, unlike most computers at the time, and what's kind of crazy is that this thing came with a single core 1 megahertz chip inside. That's a thousandth of what a gigahertz is. The Apple II, its successor, went absolutely nuts. This is the product that put Apple on the map. Completely game-changing, but with this instant success, it looks like Apple got a bit carried away. Apple III was a complete dud. In the pursuit of a quiet PC, it was built with no air vents, which made every single unit sold overheat. One of the only tech products ever where the entire first batch had a 100% failure rate. Fast forward a few more years, and we had the Macintosh, which has been shortened to Mac now, but this still carried the Apple theme forward. Macintosh, without the letter A, is actually just a variety of the fruit. And this Macintosh was actually one of the first computers to ship with a mouse, and so Apple, quite intentionally, built the keyboard to have no arrow keys. This would force both users to get used to it, and developers to design software that was specifically built for the Mac. And to give you a bit of context as to how much we've evolved since then, the microcontroller inside the charger you get with a new MacBook Pro that's just used to monitor current and voltage, that is about as powerful as the entire Macintosh. Apple and Samsung, even with their entire history of suing each other, are actually pretty codependent. You might know that the OLED displays we've seen on some iPhones are sourced from Samsung, which is just one example of many, but it's good for Apple because they get a high quality display, and it's good for Samsung because it's feeding their display business. But I do just want to address one slight misconception I've seen about this. It is true that Samsung makes these OLED displays for Apple, but it's not a case that Apple is just buying an off-the-shelf Samsung panel. Samsung would build these OLED displays, but to Apple's specification and using Apple's quality control, and so Apple Apple would still completely own the display, and it's not like Samsung could just use the same panel. You probably know, Apple products have a famously satisfying unboxing experience. Well, it turns out the company has at least one secretive packaging room, where for each upcoming product, tens and sometimes hundreds of box prototypes are tested to make sure they give the proper sensory experience. Everything from the acceleration of the lid being pulled off to the direction the seals open on the phones themselves is factored in. Tim Cook, the current CEO, whilst he wasn't there from the start, has had a pretty meteoric rise himself. He came from a really modest family, and he started his work life delivering newspapers. And even today, he's known for his dedication to the cause, famously sending emails as early as 4.30 in the morning. You might know that a good portion of Apple products are manufactured in China, and from here, there are two primary ways of getting them across the globe. Many companies use ships, but Apple almost entirely sends products by air, because it's faster, even though it can be up to 10 times more expensive. It is not easy to work for Apple. When the company's flagship Manhattan store opened, it had 10,000 applicants for a job. The number they actually accepted was 200. That is a 2% acceptance rate. That said, as of 2013, an average corporate Apple employee was earning over $120,000 per year. Now, for probably my favourite fact of all, I mentioned earlier that Apple has traditionally shown new iPhones with the time 941, but as well as the fact that this was when the original iPhone launched, there's a bigger reason. Apple's launch events often start at 9am, and the phone reveal occurs roughly 40 minutes into that presentation. Jobs insisted that the time shown on the phone screen when it was announced should completely match what the actual time was, with one extra minute given just for breathing room. It's the kind of attention to detail that you don't see with many companies. Surfshark VPN is 
is pretty crazy value. And take a listen to this. You pay $1.99 a month, and that gives you unlimited simultaneous connections. You probably already know that VPNs can keep your browsing secure, especially in public places, and also help to get around internet censorship in certain regions like China. But Surfshark does a lot more than that. As well as being able to connect to single locations, it allows you to multi-hop or encrypt your data through two different servers at the same time. Surfshark can also scan online databases to make sure your emails and passwords haven't been leaked, and lets you use something called Blind Search, an internet search tool with no logs, no tracking, and no ads. Two of the coolest things built into the VPN itself are the ability to automatically block ads, which can help load pages quicker whilst using less of your data, and the ability to access 15 different Netflix libraries from around the world. So do check the link in the description, and you can use the code BOSS to get an 83% discount and an extra month for free. Thanks a lot for watching, guys, and I will catch you in the next one.